Jon Snow was originally meant to become king in the show. Originally, the television series was supposed to be 12 seasons long, however after the sixth season, the studios got offered a Star Wars project and the show was hurried into a horrible ending. Speculations say that in the endgame, Bran the Broken was supposed to fight it out with Jon Snow for the Iron Throne, with the latter one prevailing. After the death of Daenerys Targaryen, Bran the Broken sought the whereabouts of Drogon in order for him to use his warg powers to control the dragon and burn the Northern Wall. The now three-eyed Raven Bran, ambitious as the Blood Raven who was his predecessor, would then be able to become King of the Free Folk as well, therefore ruling the entirety of Westeros as a whole. But Jon Snow, who was already banished to Castle Black, would become King beyond the Wall and form a bond with Drogon himself. Please bear in mind that these speculations come from half-truths and redit theories, but it would explain why the show ended so terribly, and why all the Jon Snow build-up led to nothing and would have probably continued into his already cancelled sequel. Cersei and Jaime's relationship is extremely messed up in the books. I would go as far as saying Jaime does not love her at all. The reason why they are together is in fact twisted and super messed up. Firstly, their relationship is described as if Cersei is a drug and Jamie is an addict, so he is in fact more addicted to being with her than having actual feelings for her. However, Cersei Lannister also suffers from a narcissistic personality disorder, and the only reason why she sleeps with Jamie is so that she can feel like she is sleeping with herself. Jamie and her are twins, and he is described to literally look like Cersei just without all the fleshly assets, so every time she sleeps or does any sexual acts with Jamie, she literally thinks like she is doing it with her own self which is just super messed up. It's for this reason why Jamie Lannister is described in the books, not as handsome or good looking, but as someone who is pretty. The only one who is as pretty as him is none other than Jon Snow. Jon is so pretty that most giants assumed he was Tormund's wife. Did you know that in the books, Cersei Lannister was super freaky in bed? Make sure you're age appropriate before watching this video. Did you know that she was so set on not getting pregnant with Robert's children, so she went as far as using other means to satisfy Robert Baratheon? What's crazy about it is that she tells this to Ned Stark, King Robert's best friend and Hand of the King. She tells Ned that she would get Robert off only by using her mouth. But things get even darker in A Feast for Crows, where during one of her chapters, she behaves like a psychopath and says that she basks in the joy of destroying Robert's seed and babies. Tens of thousands of your children have perished in my palms, your grace. Whilst you snored, I would lick your sons of my face and fingers. One by one, your seed died down and perished. All those pale and sticky princes, never being able to experience the joys of life. You claim to your rights, your grace, but in the darkness, I would eat your heirs. Her methods were not 100% successful. However, even when she would get pregnant, she would tell Jamie to get her some moon tea to prevent herself from giving birth. Did you know Aemon Targaryen is only attracted to MILFs? We saw that with Sylvia, who is a body merchant, she was literally old enough to be his mother. Later on, he even starts sleeping with Alice Rivers in the books, who is supposed to be in her 40s. I agree that the two of them sleeping together seems unlikely in season 3, due to recent show developments, but nevertheless it's obvious that Aemon is only attracted to older women. My guess is that due to not being loved by his mother, my boy has developed some mommy issues and he simply craves some form of motherly affection. He seems to like being nurtured by them, which we saw in episode 2 of House of the Dragon. It's for this reason why Alicent Hightower is probably an even worse mother than Cersei Lannister herself. Her obsession with putting Aegon on the throne and making sure he wins over her friend and rival seems to have influenced terribly over her other children. A mother's primary duty is always to love your children fairly and to nurture them impartially. And she is probably the one at fault for how Aemond and his sister turned out to be in the end. The biggest difference between the books and TV series is the fate of Catelyn Stark after the Red Wedding. In the books, three days after her death, her body is found by Nymeria, which drags her out from the river, just to be later found by the Brotherhood without banners. A former household guard of the Starks who now serves the Brotherhood begs Thoros of Mir to revive her, but he refused claiming it had been too long since she died, and a resurrection would take her very own personality. But Beric Dondarrion paid no heed to the Red Priest. He offered his own life in exchange for Lady Catelyn's, which evidently proves to be a serious mistake. Once Catelyn Stark would rise again as Lady Stoneheart, the vicious head of the Brotherhood without banners. Under her leadership, the Brotherhood changed to a more ruthless group. 
much more similar to every outlaw gang in Westeros. Its members even go as far as to violate the sacred right of the guest, which not that long ago became an even more hated crime because of the Red Wedding. Instead of protecting the commoners as their previous leader had done, they now hunt innocent members of House Frey. Lady Stoneheart only remembers her last feelings prior to her death, and now lives solely for revenge. Did you know Tyrion almost killed the mountain in the books? While seeking Dornish support during the War of the Five Kings, Tyrion offered Doran Martell the head of Gregor Clegane. He offered the Martells the opportunity for the mountain to face justice for the brutish murder of Elia Martell and her children. However, Tywin Lannister disapproved. He told him that Gregor has served House Lannister well and that no other knight in the Seven Kingdoms inspires such terror. Being able to hold the leash of such troubled character truly showcases how powerful Tywin Lannister actually was, since Sir Gregor has not only done evil in Tywin's name. He is rumored to have graped his sister and brutally dispose of her. Two of his wives have also died in mysterious circumstances. And of course, the horrific fire assault he did against his brother Sandor, who have left him traumatized for life and with a never quenching thirst for revenge. I honestly believe if Tyrion had pulled this move, the Lannisters would have made peace with the Martells, who in the books are some of their most deadly hidden enemies. Did you know that Jaime Lannister wanted to kill Robert Baratheon? Robert, fully aware that Jaime stands guard outside his chambers, would fill the room with whores that made as loud a noise as possible, simply keen to irritate Jaime to the best of his ability. This was Robert's way of showing that he couldn't care less about the Lannisters and would insult them at any given time, despite needing them. As for whether Jaime would have been able to even kill Robert in a one against one, I personally don't think so, but there are many people who do. So I will say, maybe if he was in a drunken state. It's for a similar reason why Jaime ended the Mad King as well, not just because he wanted to burn King's Landing. There were a lot of mentally unstable Targaryens after all. What truly earned him the nickname of Mad Ares was the vile things he did to his wife. It was sort of like his ritual, that every time he would burn a man to death, he would make haste to his chambers and abuse his wife. It was there where Jaime Lannister decided he would end this tyranny seeing as he had to experience the abuse daily as a king's guard standing ordered to guard their chambers. Did you know Jaime came close to marrying Catelyn Stark in the books? There was a time when Jaime was sent to River Run to marry Lysa. However, he found her completely uninteresting and instead focused more on holding conversations with Blackfish. General Blackfish and his father, Tywin Lannister, had been great friends during the War of Nine Penny Kings, when Lord Tywin was nothing but a humble knight and the stories of battle he had heard were far more interesting in his young warrior's mind than Lysa of House Tully. But there came a point where a marriage with Lady Catelyn became possible, and it would have really been interesting had it happened. If Cersei's marriage with Rhaegar Targaryen had gone through as Tywin and she intended, Jaime would have probably married Catelyn, seeing as River Run is a lot closer to Casterly Rock than Winterfell is. And if Catelyn married Jaime after Brandon Stark passed away, with River Run on their side, the Lannisters could have even contested against Robert Baratheon for the throne. Lady Catelyn in the book also found Jaime Lannister to be highly attractive, so this possibility was definitely there. Did you know dragons weren't naturally born in a song of ice and fire? They are said to descend from fireworms. Fireworms are the most horrific creatures. They were wingless fire-breathing beasts that could go monstrous in size. They were said to dwell below the 14 Flames, a chain of volcanoes located in the Valyrian Peninsula. Their affinity with the fire attribute has led many to believe that fireworms are related to the dragons themselves. Some even go as far as to theorize that fireworms and wyverns were combined through dark sorcery by the ancient Valyrians in order to create the most powerful mystical creature that would later become known as dragons. Fireworms might also be responsible for one of the most twisted stories in the extended lore. About 250 years before the main storyline, Arya Targaryen claimed Beleriand, the Black Dread, and disappeared for a year. When she returned, she looked extremely ill, with her flesh cracked and her mental state ruined. Her flesh was injured to the extreme, and strange worm-like creatures would come out of her burning flesh. Aegon knows that Helena and Aemond are secret lovers. In Episode 7, Aegon and Aemond converse with each other, and it was revealed that Aegon and his sister were to be betrothed in the tradition of House Targaryen. But it's already a well-known fact that unlike Aemond, Aegon has literally no interest in wedding his sister. In the following episode, the two are already married and with children, and during their family dinner, Jace attempts to dance with Helena in order to rough Aegon's feathers. 
but Aegon instead shifts his attention to Aemond, who was angry to the point of drawing his sword out. This simple detail shouldn't be overlooked, seeing as it firstly shows that Aegon was aware of Aemon's feelings towards his wife, meaning that he is far sharper than he lets out. This could even explain that the siblings might have an open marriage agreement, and it even opens way for theories with regards to whether their children are actually Aegon's. This could mean that Aegon's relationship with her could probably be similar to Rhaenyra's relationship with Lenor, where both parties are in agreement for mutual interests. Has King Robert become weak over the years? Despite being 38 years old, there is no concrete evidence in the books that suggests Robert Baratheon has lost his fighting skills. And age is rarely a factor of decline in the Game of Thrones universe, especially with how Barristan Selmy is still the most fearsome man in the Seven Kingdoms. The books do in fact hint that Robert is still one of the most powerful men alive, and that happened when he told Ned Stark that he wanted to abdicate the throne, move to Essos and establish his own cell sword company. The world of a sellsword isn't exactly a tame area of expertise, especially with seeing how strong the second sons were, the sellswords hired by Daenerys Targaryen. I believe Robert wanted to rejoin the fray and feel the snell of battle once more, seeing as all he does the entirety of the first season is getting lost in the nostalgia and remembrance of his Demon of the Trident days. Robert was like a beat-up steel, though not as sharp anymore. The continued battles would once again restore him to his glory. I honestly believe that with a few battles to bring him to shape, the Demon of the Trident would return once more. The horrific war crimes of the Greens after the Battle of Tumbleton. The battle took a 90 degree turn when the two riders Ulf White and Hugh Hammer shifted sides over to the Greens and unleashed the carnage of their dragons, Vermithor and Silverwing. This treachery set the town ablaze and decimated the loyalists of the Black Faction, sending the once ordinary garrisons in a disarray. Thousands were burnt to death, or drowned trying to escape the dragon's fury, but such a feat was impossible. The men of Lord Footley's yielded and begged for mercy, but the Greens beheaded them with no remorse. The victorious Green soldiers savaged and plundered the town whole, rid families of their belongings, and graped anything that could still move, from the elderly to the younglings as young as eight years old. Soldiers then went on to kill every boy and man they could find, houses and provisions were set on fire, and the once busy town became a ghost town. The shops were looted while the wealthy merchants and family were tortured for their treasure while babies were impaled on pikes. Sir Ulf allegedly graped three maiden each night and the lady of the Footley family was claimed as a prize of war. Bran the Builder was a legendary figure from the Age of Heroes. He is said to not only have found House Stark but to have also built the massive wall that separates the northern lands from the true north. He is also credited to have engineered some of the most magnificent buildings in all of Westeros, such as Winterfell, the High Towers, Storm's End, and many more. Tales from the Stormlands claim that when Brandon was a boy, he helped during God's grief build Storm's End, to defy the storm deity who took Duran's family from him. Later in life, Brandon managed to build the massive wall after the first long night. He had sought assistance from the children of the forest in building the wall, and he went as far as studying their language, the true tongue, in order to do so. The children of the forest are said to have used magic during the wall's construction, and he even managed to get the giants involved in order to move huge blocks that the building required. While Brandon the Builder is not as beloved by the singers and mummers, at least not as much as the other mythical figures, he is still one of the most important ones that helped guard the realms of men. Did you know in the books, Tywin Lannister was not as invincible as the show portrayed him, as if the consecutive defeats he suffered against Robb Stark, an inexperienced commander, were not enough, he even lost against Lord Edmure, Robb's uncle. Lord Tywin and his men were trying to cross west in order to stop Robb and his men from plundering, but Edmure intercepted them and gave them a harsh defeat, going as far as bloodying Tywin's nose and thinning their numbers. This move of him stopped them from crossing west, but Blackfish and Rob told Edmure that this would go on to cost them the war. Rob's plundering fiasco was simply a feint, he was doing it to keep Tywin out of King's Landing so that Stannis could conquer the city and execute the remaining Lannisters. So in the end, Edmure's victory, even though impressive, turned out to be a stroke of luck that would give Tywin his victory. Though I am aware that it's a very unpopular opinion, I honestly think of Tywin as more of a master schemer than a capable general. He doesn't come close in military skill to Stannis Baratheon, Randall Tarly, King Robert, or even Ned Stark in my opinion. Robert Baratheon was one of the few people in Westeros who never feared Tywin Lannister. 
and proof to that is how openly he ironizes him in front of Jamie or his sister, where he mockingly refers to him as the Kingslayer, son of the mighty Tywin. Had the illegitimacy of Joffrey and his siblings been confirmed prior to his death, Robert would have not hesitated to execute them all without mercy. This is confirmed by Ned as well, and it's because he didn't want innocent children to be executed by Robert that he hesitated to let him know on this dark truth. Although Robert at that point was way past his prime, a war with the Lannisters would have completely rejuvenated his former self, and this truth being widespread would have brought the return of the demon of the trident. Robert, though 120 more pounds than his peak self, was still in his mid-30s and still was widely liked by soldiers, well-respected by knights, and highly charismatic. And he proved that when the Greyjoys rebelled, which wasn't shown in the television series, the Bannermen still answered his call and he crushed the Ironborn in their own turf, beating them to their very own strength. Seeing as he would have been made heir, Stannis would be the first to support him. Then the Tyrells would do so as well, seeing as Renly was working into marrying Marjorie to Robert Baratheon behind the scenes. The Dornish also had deep hatred for the Lannisters, with the North, Randall Tarly and the Riverlands always ready to fight for Robert, Tywin Lannister and his household would have easily gone extinct. Did you know Tyrion threatened to kill Jaime in the books? After he found of his betrayal, he told him that he is unable to trust him any further. Why should I believe you, brother? She was my wife, the only person who loved me, the monster me. Tyrion then proceeded to hit Jaime. He struck him down mercilessly with a backhanded slap. He put all his strength to it. A slap that carried all his fear, all his rage and all of his pain. Jamie was squatting unbalanced, the blow sent him tumbling backwards to the floor. I suppose I earned that, said Jamie while mumbling to himself. You and our sweet sister and our loving father. I cannot even begin to tell you what all of you have earned, but you will have it. You shall all pay for everything I have had to endure. A Lannister always pays his debts. Give me the keys and go, I shall find Varys on my own. He cocked his head and stared at his brother with his mismatching eyes, each different in color. You only have one hand now, brother, so we can now be considered equals. We shall be well matched if we are ever to meet again. Did you know Jon Snow threatened Gilly in the books? Jon told her to take the baby and leave the castle black, but not her own baby. She was ordered by Jon to leave with the baby of Mance Raider. Jon was scared that Melisandre would burn Mance's baby due to its king's blood. So for the greater good, he ordered her to take Mance's baby and leave the castle. She was actually terrified of being separated from her own child. So she refused, however John told her the following. You can do as you please, but I promise you that on the day Mance's baby burns, your baby will too. Seeing as how serious John was, she eventually does as bid and leaves Castle Black with Mance's baby. When Maester Eamon learned what John done, he tells that to Samuel Tarly, which leaves Sam completely horrified. This also shows the differences between the John of the books and Jon Snow in the show. From a mild character who keeps saying that he doesn't want the throne, to a stern commander who is willing to make sacrifices for the greater good. He is a true leader in the books, with high ambition, and he doesn't like being defied.